But as I've shared with you, we're going to start into chapter 11 tonight in our study of Revelation. And uh, tonight as we uh, work through the particular verses, uh, we're, going to, we're going to read through them at uh, individual times. We're not going to read all of the scripture verses and then uh, go back and break them down because it'll make more sense as we uh, go through them uh, all at one time. But I'm going to ask Stacy if he'll go ahead and show us our timeline. And this is just, it's been two weeks since I've been able to teach any uh, on this. And just to sort of remind you of where we're at in uh, the, the book of Revelation. Uh, we've already worked through the, the church age, which is up to now. And then we get to chapter 4, which mentions the rapture, the, the taking out of the church, uh, those the believers. And then we've worked through the... Uh, seven seal judgments and we've worked through six and tonight we see the seventh of the trumpet judgments which basically gets us through the first half of the tribulation so we're going to be about three and a half years into the seven years of the tribulation and the tribulation is just this time period between the the rapture and the return of christ which we call the glorious appearing uh, it's the seven years there that is um, a time of judgment that God brings against mankind and against the earth. And uh, it is progressively getting worse. There's more and more uh, just horrific judgment being brought against mankind during this time. During this time, the Antichrist, which we haven't talked about yet, really, but we'll, we will be talking about him and the false prophet here in just uh, the next few weeks. Uh, they, you know, the, the Antichrist has taken over the world during this time and is uh, leading the world uh, during this time. And uh, tonight we uh, get to see what happens sort of right here just before the halfway point of the tribulation as we see that these two super witnesses come onto the scene. Uh, as we read about in uh, chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. And so as we start tonight, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 in, in Revelation chapter 11 tonight as we get started. And this is going to help, uh, help frame for us a little bit about the history of the Jewish temple. So look with me again, <clears throat> or look with me at Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. It says, Beginning in verse 1, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now, what we read about here is that uh, John is in his vision. He's given a basically a measuring stick. He's a measuring rod and told to go and measure this rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Now, we know about the temple uh, from uh, the time of King David. David wanted to build the temple, but God said, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. You're not going to be able to, uh, to uh, build this. But God allowed him to do all the fundraising, all the preparations for it. And then his son Solomon is the one who built the temple. The temple lasted for a little over uh, 400 years until it was destroyed by uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It was rebuilt twice after that before it was finally destroyed in AD 70 by the, by the Romans. And so the temple had been... Uh, had been around in the days of Jesus when he's teaching in the temple. And uh, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, had been in the temple. He, went, he knew of the destruction of the temple. And now in this vision that God is giving to him, he is told to go and, and measure this rebuilt temple. Because as we understand from what the scriptures tell us in the book of Revelation, that at the beginning of the tribulation, which uh, I'm glad Stacey hasn't moved forward yet for us, at the beginning of the tribulation, the temple is to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, according to what the uh, revelation tells us. And so uh, this, uh, the temple is to be rebuilt, but it will not be to the same grandeur as the temple of Solomon. Uh, and that is part of what we see in uh, the building, uh, in the rebuilding of the temple. Um, you know, there's, as you see, I'm going to ask Stacy to go ahead and move forward for us. Um, we're going, you know, the temple is to be rebuilt. There's prophecies that talk about that in the book of uh, Revelation and throughout the scriptures that point to the fact that, um, that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Now, looking at our current 
uh, political issues with the Middle East, it's hard for us to imagine that the Arabs would ever allow the Jews to rebuild the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. But according to what is able to be worked out by, through the, through the uh, tricks of the Antichrist and all that goes on following the rapture of the church, the Jews are able to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, again, not to the grandeur of Solomon's temple, but again, they're able to uh, rebuild it. Um, but the problem with this is, as uh, the book that we're studying through uh, by Tim LaHaye, uh, one of the things he points out is that the rebuilding of the temple is a rejection of Christ because the Jews are continuing to uh, worship, uh, basically, they're worshiping God as if the Messiah has not come. And so they're again, by them having rebuilt the temple, they're basically saying the Messiah has not come, Jesus is not the Messiah, therefore we need to worship God as God has instructed us in the law. And so they are uh, you know, rejecting Christ in that way. As you see there on the screen, the, the fact that John is told to go and measure the temple uh, means that it's going to be inadequate. It's not going to be up to the standard uh, compared to the Temple of Solomon. It's, it's just not, it's not going to uh, hold water, so to speak, compared to the Temple of Solomon. Now, it's probably going to be an impressive site, and it's going to be built with modern tools and modern uh, equipment and things like that, and it will probably go up a lot quicker than we could ever imagine. Uh, uh, there's even rumors, according to the... Uh, the commentary that uh, there are Jews around the world that have already pledged money for the rebuilding of the temple and supplies are already being gathered. At, you know, uh, and, and if that's the case, then you know, with today's modern equipment and uh, a whole lot of funding from uh, Jews around the world, that temple could be built in short order, uh, I'm sure. But nevertheless, it's still going to be inadequate as compared to the temple of Solomon. Uh, the other thing is that this uh, temple is going to be built at the beginning of the tribulation. Those seven years, the temple is going to be built at the very beginning of the tribulation. Because in the middle of it, as we're going to see, as it says there, in uh, chapter 13, in two weeks, when we get to chapter 13, we're going to see that in verse 2, it talks about how the Antichrist will break his covenant. He's going to have a contract, a covenant with the Jewish people. And halfway through the uh, the tribulation at that halfway point he breaks that covenant uh, with them and what happens is he goes and he sets up an idol in the holy of holies he goes and sets up a uh, an idol a false idol in the temple which is going to cause obviously the, those that are Jewish worshiping God through the temple worship they're going to go ballistic over that because that's just not, you know, that is that is a great heresy to them that, that they would ever uh, put up this, uh, allow this idol in the temple. And so we read in verses 1 through uh, 1 and 2 that basically uh, John is told to go and measure this temple that has been rebuilt in Jerusalem uh, right after the rapture of the church. Uh, we want, you know, if you're a Christian uh, and you're uh, not already in heaven, if you're raptured uh, at the beginning, uh, of the tribulation there like we uh, read about, then this is something that we're going to miss. We're not going to see how uh, the temple comes together, at least not from earthly eyes uh, as we would understand it. But what we see is that in verses 3 through 14, that John tells us about these two witnesses, these two uh, super witnesses that are in Jerusalem uh, and what they're trying to do uh, during this time. So I want you to read with me in verses 3 through 14 as it tells us about uh, these witnesses. It says, beginning in verse 3, it says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. That's the Antichrist, okay? So that you understand that. Uh, and overpower and kill them. <clears throat> their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, that's Jerusalem. 
uh, in the great city which is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. That reminds us that it's Jerusalem. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, of a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. The third woe is coming soon. And so right here we get a glimpse into the ministry of these two super witnesses that God ordains to come and minister in Jerusalem, obviously to the nation of Israel. And so uh, the first thing you see there in your notes is that God will... Uh, he will give power to these guys. They will have these two uh, special witnesses are going to have power that God that is used to differentiate between the power of God and the tricks of the Antichrist. Because everything that God does is authentic. Okay, God is an originator. Okay, let's let's look at it that way. Everything that God does is original. The crucifixion is original. God's creation is original. Everything that Satan does is a counterfeit. Okay? And so everything that he does is a trick. Everything he does has to be copied, so to speak, from God. And so as we'll see later, uh, the Antichrist is killed and then resurrected. Notice how I'm saying that. Look at me for just a second. Resurrected. Okay? Uh, and we see that it's a copy, it's a counterfeit of the resurrection of Christ. And if you just know a little bit about the story of Christ in those days, and you've heard just a little bit about it, and then you see this man who's led the world, uh, you know, uh, come back to life, so to speak, you could very easily be deceived of this counterfeit resurrection. And so everything that Satan does through the Antichrist is a trick. It's a, it's a counterfeit. It's a copy of, of the good things that God tries to do. And so God is showing through these two super witnesses, He is showing His power and the, the control and the power that He still has. Um, as it says there in your notes, these two witnesses are going to be able to do four things as we see. Uh, one is they're going to be able to send fire out of their mouths and kill those who try to persecute them. Um, that's that ought to really put the fear of God, no pun intended, in those that would want to persecute these individuals. Um, not only that, they have the power to shut up the heavens so the earth will be covered with a great drought. Now remember, the earth has already been experiencing these awful plagues and famine and uh, losing part of the light of the sun and part of the light of the moon and all of these other things. Uh, all of, you know, part of the uh, water has been, uh, you know, made to where it can't be, uh, it's not drinkable. All of these things have happened. And then on top of all of these things, now one of these witnesses that God has, has the power to shut up the heavens. The ability to cause a drought. And there is this great drought on the earth because of it. Not only that, they also have the power to turn water into blood. And it's a little reminiscent of Moses in the Old Testament. But this one of these witnesses has that power. And they also have the ability to release all manner of plagues on the earth. And so the people in that day, it's already been bad for them. And now these two super witnesses have even more power because, or, or the ability to cause more difficulty for the people on earth as God is continuing uh, to bring His judgment against mankind. Now, one of the big questions we have is, who are these two witnesses? And that's something that we would all be very curious about. Okay, these guys sound like they, they are not... You know, they're not taking anything off of anybody, so to speak. They're, they're coming in and they're all business. And so we see this and we're like, man, who are these guys? They, you know, they're coming in and, uh, you know, really uh, giving it to them. Well, there are suggestions as to who these uh, two witnesses could be. There, there's thoughts that it could be Elijah and Enoch. It could be Elijah and John the Baptist, or maybe even that it's Elijah 
and Moses. Those are some of the people that uh, people believe uh, this could be. Uh, but we don't. The thing you have to understand is we do not know 100% unequivocally who these people are. But there's some really good information that we pull from the Old Testament and from what is told to us here in Revelation that we can make a really good guess as to who we think it is. Um, there is not enough scriptural support that it could be either Enoch or John the Baptist. Uh, that ne neither one of those, there's not enough scriptural support to say to really push them to the front of the list. Uh, but one of those witnesses is most likely Elijah. Uh, from what we remember in the books of the kings and we, we read about uh, the time of Elijah, uh, we know that he was, he was able to use fire to destroy the prophets of Baal. Uh, we know that he was able to shut up uh, the heavens and it didn't rain for over three years. And so we know, and obviously he done all of that through the power of God. I think that's, uh, you know, uh, something that is sort of un unwritten. We understand that. But through the power that God gave him, uh, he was able to do those things. And so these, one of these witnesses, are, are, he's able to do things identical to that that Elijah did. And so more than likely, it's one of those, prof, or one of those witnesses uh, is the prophet Elijah. Now the other witness is probably most likely Moses because of his place in Jewish history and the fact that he uh, was able to bring plagues on the earth. He, you know, he, he, he put his staff into the Nile and it turned to blood. And there's all these other, uh, all these other plagues that, uh, the other nine plagues that happened in Egypt. We, under, we could understand that. Something else that probably points to the fact that, uh, that sort of corroborates that it's probably uh, Elijah and Moses is the fact that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus met with Moses and Elijah. And so because of their prominent place in the Jewish faith, it makes sense that the miracles they're doing are reminiscent. They're very, you know, very identical to what those two, pro those two men did. And so more than likely, uh, those are the two uh, witnesses. Now, the, the work that these men are to do uh, is, uh, is pretty impressive because the work of these two witnesses uh, is told to us. It's outlined in the text there and it's primarily that they are to be a witness of God. That is their, that's their primary responsibility. They are to be a witness for God, meaning that they are to tell what they have seen, to tell what they have observed. They are a witness, just like in a trial, just like we are to be witnesses for Christ. They're to tell what they have seen and they share that with people. And uh, the work that they do falls into basically three categories. And you see that in your notes there. One is preaching, one is prophesying, and the other is testifying. And so their primary responsibilities are going to be these three areas. They're going to be preaching, meaning that they're going to be trying to convert people. Uh, you know, and also do that through their prophesying and testifying. But they're going to be preaching the gospel. They're going to be prophesying, basically telling people what's going to be happening so that they will turn from their sins and turn to God. And then they're also going to be testifying. Testifying is basically the same as witnessing, if you want to look at it in that regard. We're testifying. We're telling about what God has done. We're testifying as if we're a witness in a court case. And that's what these uh, two witnesses are going to be doing. They're going to be preaching. They're going to be preaching the gospel. They're going to be prophesying, telling people what's going to be happening uh, in, in what is to come in the hopes that they will turn from their sin to Christ. And then finally, they'll be testifying. And can you imagine the testimony that Elijah and Moses would have? I mean, think about that. I mean, they're going to have the, the testimony to end all testimonies. And they're going to be there in Jerusalem preaching and prophesying and, and sharing their testimony with the people trying to lead them to faith in Christ. And so they're going to have uh, a, a big task ahead of them. But what we read about, though, is that the, uh, these two witnesses are killed. 
We read about this uh, in this uh, in this text. They're they're doing their job. They're doing what they're supposed to do, and they're killed uh, by the Antichrist. Uh, we know that from what we read uh, here in chapter eleven that the Antichrist will hate these two witnesses. He will hate them so much because of the fact that they're doing this prophesying. They're doing this preaching and and testifying. They're doing all of these things, and it's going to infuriate. The Antichrist. He's going to hate them. He's going to make war against them. And he's going to try and kill them. And until, uh, as we'll read in just a second, uh, until their work is done, they'll be immune to the uh, attacks of the Antichrist or anyone else that is trying to harm them. As we see, you know, it tells that they'll breathe fire out of their mouth, so to speak, and be able to uh, destroy those that are trying to harm them. But when their work is done, that's when the Antichrist will be able to kill them. Uh, We see that he, you know, the Antichrist will have no power over them until, as it says there, they have finished their testimony. When they are through sharing their testimony, that's when the Antichrist will be able to kill them. Uh, that's when he will be successful in killing them. And, uh, and, and what we read after this about what happens to their bodies and things like that, it just shows you the, the, just the, the horrible nature of, of the time of the tribulation and the view that people have and the disregard that people have for human life. Uh, and the respect that we, you know, that we would generally give to the dead even today, uh, you know, this, it's, it's just unbelievable how people will act during this time. But what we'll see is that, that in the streets of Jerusalem, their bodies will be left for three days and, or three and a half days. And uh, this, uh, the city of Jerusalem is going to be so wicked if you want to, or, or uh, so spiritually bad, if you want to look at it that way, that they'll be called Sodom and Egypt. And that's a, that's a figurative term, uh, and it, it's to symbolize the immorality uh, associated with Sodom and to symbolize the materialism of Egypt. Egypt was one of these great, uh, rich kingdoms. Uh, throughout the ancient world, they were known for for being all about the gold and and you know just having so much wealth, and they were very materialistic. And we know from uh, the book of Genesis that Sodom was just this uh, wretched place of immorality, and so uh, Jerusalem is being compared to both of those that they are going to be so immoral and so materialistic. They're going to be the, the people in Jerusalem are going to be compared uh, to the people of these two uh, places. Now, one of the things that is kind of interesting is that as we read this, we're going to see that you know, as we as we've read that when these uh, two witnesses are killed and they're left in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, that everybody in the world will be able to see uh, them laying in the streets. Now, there are some of you uh, that. Uh, were born a year or two ago when this would not have been able to have occurred. Uh, you know, how long has television been around? 60 years at most, uh, give or take, 60 to 70 years. There, there was a time until just in the last century that this would not have been possible. Uh, television, you know, now makes it available. You know, I mean, think about it. I pull out my cell phone right here and I could pull up, you know, a basketball game or a football game that might be going on. Uh, well, there's no football games going on, but I could find a basketball game right now on my phone and we could all watch it and not even be anywhere near that place. And so the fact that television and the invent of satellites and things like that have made this so much easier for people to actually gain access to watch this sort of thing. See, people 70 or 80 years ago, the idea of everybody watching these two dead people in Jerusalem was, was just the farthest science fiction you could imagine. It didn't make sense to them. For us, that's not uncommon. Well, that's not, I mean, think about it. How many people in the world are watching the Olympics right now? I mean, that's all across the world. I mean, it, it's, it's easy for us to imagine that now. And so they, because of this, people from all over the world are, going, world are going to be watching this. But here is the thing. They're going to be celebrating the death of these people as if it were Christmas. These two witnesses are going to die. They're going to lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And people are going to have been so tormented by the testimony, the preaching, and the prophesying of these two men. They will have been so spiritually tormented. 
Not in a not like these people were bad hurting them. It was the fact that they, you know, people could not stand the truth being taught and preached by these people. But they were so tormented by it that when they died and are laying in the streets with cameras on them, that people are celebrating it like it's Christmas, giving gifts and receiving gifts. I mean, that just shows you how degenerate our society will be during the tribulation. That they will be celebrating the death of these two people as if it was Christmas. A, a time for giving gifts and things like that. And so it just... It, it shows you how bad things are going to be all the more during the uh, during the tribulation. Now, of course, God is not one to be outdone by mankind and uh, or the tricks of Satan. And so, what happens is after lying dead in the streets after three days, uh, as it says here in the scripture, a breath of life from God will enter into these two witnesses, and they'll be resurrected. They will be resurrected as as Christ was resurrected. Uh, and uh, they'll, uh, they'll be asked or told to come up here. Basically, they'll be raptured out of the earth, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and they'll leave earth and ascend into heaven. You can look at that as symbolic of the rapture. You can look at that as being symbolic of the ascension of Christ. But it's basically the same thing. It's you know, either way you want to look at it. Uh, they're told to come up here, come to heaven, and, and they leave uh, this earth. Now, the, the thing that happens, though, is when all of these people who have been watching this happen, these people laying in the streets, they've been giving gifts, they've been celebrating. Well, when they see this, they're going to, it's going to strike terror into their hearts. They're going to be terrified over this occurrence. And so uh, when they witness these guys going up into heaven, it's going to strike terror into their hearts. They're going to, they're going to be so afraid of what, happened, of what happens. But here is the catch. They, they understood what happened I mean, or where this came from. As, we, as it tells us, uh, you know, they, they understand where this is coming from, but it, it's just further confirmation for them. The resurrection of these men and then their ascension or their rapture into heaven just further shows the people in Jerusalem and around the world that these two men were men of God. That, that, that they were sent by God. They had a task to do and they did what God intended them to do. And so they, it was just more confirmation uh, that they were men of God. But God, again, does not let the sinfulness of man go uh, without being judged. And basically what we read about next in, in chapter 11 is God's judgment on Jerusalem. And specifically on Jerusalem because that's where the two witnesses were at. Uh, so uh, as we read here, what happens is after the way people in Jerusalem have treated these uh, two witnesses and the way that they've acted after their deaths, what happens is there is this earthquake that hits Jerusalem. There's an earthquake that hits Jerusalem and it destroys a tenth of the city. I mean, that is a massive part of this international city. Uh, one tenth of the city is destroyed. I mean, it's just, it's a level. And not only that, 7,000 people are killed. I mean, that is, that is a large number of people anytime. You know, if, if we heard about a, 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 an earthquake in some part of the world right now and 7,000 people died, we would, we would be in shock even now. You know, man, that's a lot of people. But you have to remember, remember how many people have died already? That the, the world population has been greatly diminished because of those that have been raptured and those that have died because of some of the uh, different judgments that have been brought. And not only that, a lot of people who have become Christians during the tribulation are martyred. They're killed for their faith. And so as the world population has drastically dwindled, now all of a sudden 7,000 people in this major city, in a hub of all of this going on in the book of Revelation during the end times, all of a sudden 7,000 people are just gone uh, through this earthquake. And, you know, during this time, even though the people... Uh, are terrified because of what has happened. They still gave glory to the God of heaven, as it tells us. I mean, it's just, it blows our mind that they can be so wicked on one hand, leaving these two witnesses out in the streets and celebrating their deaths in the way they did. And here, they're, they're terrified at the judgment God has brought, but yet they're still going to give Him the glory uh, for 
what he's doing. You know, and it's believed that this uh, will bring about a spiritual revival in Jerusalem. Um, that this will further aid the work of the two witnesses who are no longer here, but also the work of the 144,000 uh, uh, Jewish uh, witnesses that will be sharing, or servants of God who will be sharing during that time. And so uh, what this does is this brings us to uh, verses 15 through 19, which uh, we'll uh, look at very quickly, uh, because all, it does, all this does is tell us about the seventh trumpet. So remember, there's been the seven seals, they've, or there were six seals, they were broken, and on the seventh seal, it was basically, when that was broken, it was an introduction to the seven trumpet judgments. And then so we've been through the sixth trumpet judgments and now we're to the seventh trumpet and it's basically an introduction to the seven bowl judgments and which are just seven more uh, calamities and judgments that God brings against mankind and so uh, one of the things that you need to understand is that what we're going to read in the next uh, in chapters 12 13 14 and 15 are sort of going to be this uh, parentheses it's going to be this uh, we've led up to the seventh judgment or the seventh uh, trumpet, and now chapters twelve through fifteen are going to be this uh, this um, sort of parentheses in the story, and it's going to tell us about things that have been happening throughout the whole tribulation. Okay, and so for us to understand the the, the timeline here, what we need to understand is that chapters twelve through fifteen are going to be sort of this overlay of the whole tribulation. Okay, it's not going to be that we've led up to the middle of the tribulation and there all this is going to happen. This is going to be things, and I'll remind you of this in the coming weeks. Twelve through fifteen are going to be uh, things that have been happening throughout the whole tribulation. One of it's going to be the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the false prophet, and things that they've done during this time. How Satan has attacked Israel, and all of these things that are going to be going on. So I'll remind you in the coming weeks that what we're going to start looking at after this seventh trumpet that is blown, as we read about here, following this, this is going to be stuff that is happening throughout the entire tribulation time. Now, we're going to look at verse 15 uh, right now because this is where we read about the first angelic chorus here. Uh, look at verse 15. It says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, this group of voices in heaven, we, we assume that these are angels from the, uh, from the uh, text. It says you know, that the angel blew this and there were loud voices in heaven. And so uh, the predominant voices are going to be the voices of those angels. Uh, they tell us and announce two things. And the first thing that they announce is that uh, in heaven, at the beginning of the last half of the tribulation, basically the one world kingdom that the Antichrist has, uh, has created, it will be conquered by the kingdom of Christ. Basically, what they're saying is that the, uh, they're, they're basically announcing to the world that the Antichrist is going to be defeated by Christ. That, that the kingdom of Christ is going to overpower and defeat the kingdom of the Antichrist. And that is, you know, you've heard, you've heard preachers uh, say, I've read the end of the book talking about the Bible, and I know we win, so I'm not worried. This is what they're talking about uh, as we finish reading. Basically, Christ is going to defeat the Antichrist. Christ is going to defeat Satan. And Christ is victorious. You know, victory in Jesus. One of our favorite hymns, so to speak. You know, we, this, is where we, this is where we get that from. Uh, but not only will the kingdom of the Antichrist be conquered by, by Christ... Uh, it's an indication, There's a, this verse also indicates that Christ is going to reign forever and ever. That once Christ comes to earth, once he's here, there will be no interruption of his government, of his kingdom. There will be no uh, disruption in the fact that Christ will be reigning. Yes, we know that, uh, as we'll see in, in the coming weeks, Christ will rule for a millennia. There will be the, the, the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. But just because that thousand years ends doesn't mean that Christ is no longer going to be in charge or that he's going to somehow be defeated or anything like that. Basically, once Christ returns at the glorious appearing, it's all over for Satan. Let's just look at it that way. Yes, Satan will be released and be given some uh, opportunity to do some stuff, but we know that Christ will have no interruption in his kingdom. 
But then in verses 16 uh, through 18, we read about this song of the 24 elders. Look at verses 16 and uh, 16 through 18 with me. It says, uh, beginning in verse 16, it says, And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. One of the things that we read here is that these 24 elders that are encircling the throne of God, they're seated on their own thrones. We talked about this just a little bit this morning. Uh, They're the ones that were holding the golden bowls of incense that I talked about this morning, which are the prayers of God's people. Uh, These 24 elders are surrounding the throne there and they sing this song. And what this song does is it shows us the animosity of people during Uh, the tribulation towards Christ and His return. It shows us just, I mean, the way that they're talking, the way that they're referencing uh, the people of the earth, it shows us how how much anger and animosity and hard feelings there were, there will be towards Christ and His return during the tribulation. There are going to be people who, no matter what goes on during the tribulation, they're still not going to put, put their faith in Christ. And for some of them, it's going to harden their heart even more. And they're going to become more angry and more disillusioned with Christ the longer the tribulation goes on until ultimately they're judged as we read in uh, chapter 20 of Revelation. But what we see here is in verse 19, he gives us a, a, a... a glimpse of the vision he has, uh, John does, uh, about the temple of God in heaven. And so look at that. It's in, in verse 19 and we'll be done. It says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and great hailstorm. And a great hailstorm. Uh, you know, right here what we see is that there, John sees this vision of the temple in heaven. And he sees in the temple there, he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, for those of you who thought Indiana Jones found it, uh, he hasn't. Uh, we see that it's, uh, it's in heaven as, as far as John views it here. Now, does that mean that it is the literal uh, Ark of the Covenant that Moses had uh, created? Very well could be. We don't know. Uh, and, you know, as far as what the Bible tells us about the ark, it's lost to history. You know, uh, prior to the attack by the Babylonians, it sort of fades from the pages of the Bible. We don't know what happened to it. But what we do know is that uh, John sees in his vision of the temple of God in heaven, he sees this uh, ark of the covenant. And the commentary writer, Tim LaHaye, uh, he tells us that this could be a reminder that they are dealing with a covenant-keeping God. It's a reminder to Israel uh, that the God who gave them the Ark of the Covenant in the beginning is the same God who is trying to get them to turn to their Messiah even then. And so this, uh, and as he closes out there, the lightning and the, the thunder and all that goes on there, Uh, shows us that this scene in heaven that John is witnessing, that John is relating to us, it is over. And the events that are about to occur are showing us about events that are going to be happening uh, in the affairs of human beings going forward. And so from now on, from chapter 12 to chapter 15, we're going to be witnessing a lot of the things that happen throughout the entire tribulation, not just at the halfway point where we're at now in our timeline. These things are going to be happening throughout the entire uh, tribulation. And so uh, 